It's the week of September 24th, 2018, and you're listening to the Missouri Growing Point Agronomy Podcast. I'm your co-host, Pioneer Field Agronomist Jamie Farmer, and with me as always is my counterpart to the East, Nick Monning. This week we're also pleased to be joined by Scott Dickey, our counterpart covering Northwest and West Central Missouri, so welcome to the show, Scott. Thanks, Jamie. Welcome back, listeners. This week we're going to talk about corn yields, end-of-season soybean diseases, some of the things that we're seeing out there, and then possibly get into some of the tips for wheat planting as we start to get uh, a little bit farther in here to harvest and think about the things to come. So with that, we'll jump in with corn yields first. As we mentioned last time, corn yields have been extremely variable across the area. We do have quite a bit of plot data coming in. Those averages are ranging anywhere from 65 bushels an acre in that D3 to D4 drought area to about 259 bushels per acre in some of those areas that have received more rain. So again, like we mentioned in previous episodes, a lot of variability out there across Missouri, um, but there has probably been one overall arching theme is that yields have been a little bit better than what most folks expected, despite how uh, severe some of that drought was. So if you were to look at that map, uh, the lowest averages were generally coming from that D3 to D4 drought areas, particularly if you were to look at the mid-August map, which would be north of the Missouri River, generally stretching from northwest to north central Missouri. Part of it does stretch right into the very center part of the state, Obviously, with rainfall, was extremely variable this year, though, and so there are pockets of extreme drought outside of those areas. The best yields so far coming from the extreme northwest Missouri, west central Missouri, Sling County area, for example, and along the Missouri and Mississippi rivers in eastern Missouri. So areas on good soil and many receiving some timely rains uh, will definitely see quite a bit of a difference in yield level versus those in those extreme drought areas. Um, with that in mind, Nick and Scott, are there uh, any particular hybrids that have really shined? I know we advanced six new yellow corn hybrids this year, four of those with above average drought tolerance. So obviously with the drought that we've had, those probably seem to shine a little bit in some of the plots I've been looking at. But you all have looked at data across the state. What are some of the highlights that you're seeing from those new hybrids? I'll go first, Jamie. Some of our newer hybrids this year on the early end have been shining very nicely for us. We've been excited about a new hybrid PO688 AM. Um, that hybrid is going to be a product that we utilize in areas where we've previously been using PO589. And so far this year, we're seeing about a four-bushel yield improvement with uh, 0688 versus uh, PO589 with about a 68% wind factor. Um, another earlier maturing hybrid for us is PO977 AM. When we look at that one, it's going to be a fairly widely adapted product for us that we intend to use to replace some of our previous products. And then so far this year, we're seeing about a six bushel advantage over P1151 AM with about a 73% win percentage and about a bushel over P0805 AM. Definitely some good yield data coming from those uh, three products there. Nick, are there any others that have kind of caught your eye? I know there's a couple there in that 112, 114-day range that really shine in my area. Yeah, Jamie, we brought on a few other new ones in that uh, later maturity, that 111 through 114, just to try to help bring in some drought tolerance. And when we look at a product like 1138, which got brought on to kind of bridge the gap between 1197 high yield and 1151 drought tolerance, the thing's having a really good year. It, Despite yield levels, it's winning. When we look at really high yield levels, it's winning. When we look at really low yield levels, right now it's holding about a 17 bushel advantage over 1151 and winning 97% of the time. So that is appearing to be a very good product for us and something that could be a cornerstone. One to pair with that would be 112-day 1244, which will be a new Aquamax hybrid. It is one that we're looking in the future we could potentially replace 1151. 1151's been a workhorse for us. It's been a cornerstone in the lineup, something with great drought tolerance that handles a lot of the, the tough Missouri upland that we tend to encounter. Well, 1244 comes in there. This year it's holding a double-digit advantage over 1151. Something we wonder about in a drought year, can it handle the toughness that 1151 can? And that thing, despite yield levels, is beating 1151 up and down. So it's got the drought tolerance. It's got the workhorse ability. It's going to come with better stress emergence in 1151 and better roots. So that has been a very good surprise for us. And 1464 AML, that's a new 114-day, something we brought on with some yield stability to maybe replace 1498 in the future. Great uniformity out of that product, great ear consistency out of it. And the one thing that is has been somewhat shocking and been great is that at high yield levels, that thing, Jamie, has got some tremendous top-end yield potential. 
So it's got yield stability and high yield potential, which two things we really like to see. Absolutely, Nick. And that's one thing I've noticed just looking at some of the plots coming from uh, outside my area, which has definitely had a lot more of the drought stress, uh, in, basically encompassing that D3, D4 area. Uh, 1464 looks like it's definitely got that top end gear and some of those high yield plots you've had over on your side of the state. So definitely a lot to look forward to with our new lineup there. One of the other big questions, I guess, or the number one question right now as we transition here into soybeans is, well, you know, why is my soybean field so green or why do I have patches of green in it? Why did it green back up after the last rain? And why do some of my earlier fields look greener than the later ones? So, you know, Scott, with those questions that we're getting out there in the field, what are some of the answers that come to mind, you know, when you're thinking about those things with these green stems and green green soybeans out there? Well, typically we see green patches in fields every year for multiple reasons. They can vary from having viral infections in portions of a field. Stink bug feeding can cause stems to stay green in some cases. And then, of course, applying fungicides in the past has shown uh, potential to cause fields to stay green. But when we have a year like this where we've had such extreme conditions that have been dominated by very dry and in some cases fairly warm conditions, we tend to run into green stem syndrome situations uh, where we have soybean varieties that are nearing maturity and they experience severe stress. And that causes some of the uh, plants to abort their flowers and pods. And then after that occurs, we get a late rain event that causes the plants to green up and become more active, photosynthesize, produce a lot of sugars. And at that point, when we've lost all of our pods and flowers or uh, some percentage of those pods and flowers, we have nowhere for all the sugars to go in those plants. And when that occurs, the stems will tend to stay green while we have mature pods on the plants. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And that's something that, you know, you mentioned there. In years past, we typically see it where it's more viral induced, but obviously with the drought stress that we had this year and then kind of the drought ending rains that many of the areas got there towards the end, that's probably the the largest likely cause there. With that though, uh, I guess the biggest question would be, you know, what do I do about it where I have these green stems, these green soybean plants with mature pods? Yeah, Jamie. So really when it comes to what you can do about it, there's only really three options. Number one option is you grind through them with the combine. So that the soy seed moisture is probably ready to go, but obviously the plant isn't. If you got a whole field of that, that's probably not an option. But if you just have green patches out there, maybe you have sand veins or something, you can grind through those. The second option would be you can defoliate those soybeans. So there, there are some herbicides like Gramoxone, like Sharpen, like AIM. You could even use Roundup on non-Roundup ready beans like Liberty beans or conventional beans. Those are labeled for defoliation. Uh, you'll have to read the labels because there are certain qualifications or certain specifications when it comes to timing and also when it comes to pre-harvest interval. Uh, the only thing is some of those fields have pretty low yield potential and some people will kind of rule that out based on spending more money on a, on a crop that's probably going to be lower yielding to start with. The third and probably final option is you just wait for a frost or you hope that some sudden weather change will trigger something and cause some of that greenness to go away. This obviously is a pretty tough place to be. As Dickie mentioned earlier, when the pods are mature and the seeds are ready to go, but that plant's still green, it could be waiting a while and we could have things like shatter and everything else that, that occurs waiting. Excellent point. Not necessarily any really great options there, but uh, good to lay out You know what those three are. So something else that we're seeing in soybeans as well would uh, be some seed quality concerns. You know, we mentioned Cercospora leaf blight earlier this season, seeing that showing up where we've had the warm, humid weather to allow that infection to set in. Where those infections have been heavy, particularly in fields where folks haven't used a fungicide, I'm finding a lot of these soybean seeds that have this purple seed stain. And really what's happening there is that Cercospora infection has infected the pod, and then that pod, or that infection was able to transfer from the pod to the soybean seeds. So don't be surprised to see some soybeans out there in that grain tank that have a purple seed stain transitioning out from the hyla across that soybean seed. In most cases, it's just a cosmetic look, so not necessarily a concern from a rod or anything like that, but obviously some quality concerns from the discoloration. Anything else out there, Scott? I know you've seen some things out there in the pods as well up there in northwest Missouri that have got some folks that are concerned when it comes to quality. Yes, Jamie. Uh, yesterday in particular, but uh, recently we've been hearing a lot of situations where we see some moldy beans in uh, plants uh, in the early maturing varieties. Uh, like I said, again, in uh, northwest Missouri in particular, 
And that is also related to kind of what we were talking about with green stems, but this is a different situation where we have plants that were nearing maturity, uh, R6, R7 stage, when we started to have increased humidity and the heavy rainfall about a month ago. Soybean varieties that are in that late uh, reproductive growth stage range are very susceptible to having diseases like Phomopsis and Diaportha complex, which is pod and stem blight, infect particularly the lower pods of the plants, resulting in a white mold around the seed. And that definitely can cause some issues with uh, shrinkage and crinkling of the seed, as well as having the mold around them. So that's been a big issue kind of tied in with the conditions we've seen this year, along with the Cercospora that you mentioned. Unfortunately, out here in Missouri, there's all kinds of stuff to find out in soybean fields right now. So with that, there's also uh, something that we don't typically find a lot in Missouri with Decti stem borers. So Nick, I know you've been seeing some of that on your side of the state. Anything in particular there that you wanted to make note on what you've been observing? Yeah, Jamie, so as you mentioned, you can find almost everything in a soybean field in Missouri right now. But one other thing I've been finding a lot of is Decti stem borer, and it's not something that we commonly occur, at least this part of the geography of Missouri. I know southern Missouri does, but that's essentially just a larva that will tunnel through that pith tissue, eat it out, and cause the plant to struggle to transport nutrients and, and water throughout the plant. It can also girdle that lower stem, so whenever it comes fall, those plants may fall over and lodge there at harvest, making them unharvestable. And because those eggs, the adults kind of bore into the stem and lay those eggs, it is really hard to control them with an insecticide, and that larva will live inside of the plant, so you really can't get an insecticide to kill those. So there's really not a lot of options. When it comes to options, it's more cultural type things like timely harvest to make sure those plants don't fall over at harvest, crop rotation, Fall tillage can help just by exposing them more to the elements in the winter, causing them to freeze out. And then just effective weed management. There are some weeds that will harbor Stectes stem borer um, that we got to try to get rid of. But hopefully, Jamie, this is kind of an oddity and not a normal thing across Missouri, just something based on 2018. Yes, definitely a unique year, Nick. A lot going on out there in those soybean fields. If you've got some questions as you uh, continue to evaluate some of those fields, obviously reach out to your Pioneer sales professional and your Pioneer team. We'd be happy to take a look and evaluate and see if there's any sort of management solutions that we can implement in the future to avoid some of those things. So with that, we'll move on into wheat. So we've got uh, wheat planting right around the corner here. One of the things, you know, just to remember right out of the gate with wheat planting, that if you're going to be no-tilling your wheat, the first step of the process begins when you harvest uh, that that previous crop with that combine. So you want to be sure to do the best job to distribute the residue as evenly as possible. If not, it can become difficult for the drill to cut through heavy piles of res residue. That usually ends up with seed on top of the ground, and which would be more subject to winter kill and poor germination, etc. So you know, right out of the gate as we're continuing to harvest, that's probably the first thing that, that I would mention when it comes on tips to wheat planting. Anything else you guys would add? One other thing I'd keep in mind is if you're going to plant wheat following corn, make sure you're picking varieties that have a, a good tolerance or a good uh, resistance to fusarium head scab. That's something we look for in Missouri anyway, but uh, it's particularly important whenever you're following uh, corn when you plant your wheat. Yeah, a good one there. Anything on fertility, Nick, that uh, we need to keep in mind when it comes to planting wheat? Yeah, despite popular belief, you know, wheat tends to go on the roughest ground and probably the lowest fertility, and uh, people tend to think that's the place where wheat goes. But wheat does, despite popular belief, require good fertility. It requires a lot of phosphorus in the fall in order to get tillering going and good early fall growth. So when we're going after, I mean, we're obviously you have to follow soil test recommendations is what we'd want to do, but... It is not uncommon if you're trying to grow high-yielding wheat to be putting on 150 pounds of DAP or more uh, just to get that plant going in the fall. And 20 to 40 pounds of nitrogen is always a good idea, Jamie, just to get that early fall tillering going. Uh, we don't want to overdo it in the fall, but just a little bit. And a lot of times that gets supplemented from the DAP, so the DAP will take care of a lot of those nitrogen needs. Good point. Wheat does require some fertility to get a crop out of that. Another thing, when we're talking about planting wheat, if you decide to till your seed bed rather than to no-till that wheat in, you want to make sure that it is a well-prepared seed bed. You know, it may require more than one pass because you need to have good seed to soil contact. There's an old saying that uh, you want to sow wheat in the dust, and it definitely has some truth uh, just to make sure that you have an opportunity for that seed to have good seed to soil contact and good germination. Uh, with that, talking about planting there, Dickie, anything you would add there as far as recommended seeding rates? 
Well, seeding rates is probably one of the bigger questions I get every year. You know, we get a lot of guys always talk about how many pounds of seed they're applying, but I don't know that they're taking into account the seed count per pound. I like to try to get guys to think about their seeding rate in terms of seeds per acre instead of pounds per acre. And in that case, I'd like to shoot for somewhere around one and a half million seeds per acre. Uh, a good thought rule of thumb for a range would be about 1.4 to 1.8 million seeds per acre, depending on the situation that you're planning into. If it's getting a little later or in less than ideal soil conditions, you might want to increase your rates closer to that 1.8 or about 10% over your normal seeding rate. Nick, what do you shoot for when we're talking about planting depth on that? Yeah, planting depth, one of the most popular popular topics when it comes to any crop, um, but especially with wheat. Typically, we like to shoot for that 1 to 1.5 inches on planting depth on wheat. If you plant it shallower, you tend to be more prone to winter heaving or problems come later on in spring. Good point. And uh, the last thing there, Scott, we're talking about this thing called a Hessian fly-free date. Could you could explain a little bit about that and kind of the dates that we see here in Missouri. At this time, you know, guys, we're kind of moving into the period where people are starting to think about sowing their wheat here in the last few days of September into the first weeks or so of October. Uh, one of the things we have to keep in mind is Hessian fly-free date. The Hessian fly is a pest that can lay eggs in the straw of the plant, which can result into problems uh, next year. It seems like guys are starting to not pay as close attention to that as what we used to. In some cases, that might be all right, considering the use of insecticide seed treatment that we have now. We're using higher rates of cruiser on our seed treatment, and that does provide us some protection from Hessian fly, as well as uh, early infestations of aphids in the fall. Uh, but in general, if we keep a uh, northern part of Missouri in that first week or so of October, last couple of days of September, you'd be in pretty good shape. And then as we move south into central Missouri, closer to the Ozarks, we can consider planting somewhere around the 7th to the 10th of October as being a good start window for planting. Yeah, and just the last point on that, you know, if you're planting too early, can cause some excessive fall growth, but... Uh you know, also possibly being more prone to viral infections and winter kill. So with that, you know, just some timely tips there to keep in mind as we start to roll right in here pretty soon into uh, sowing the wheat crop. Talked about things you want to remember as you harvest the previous crop, some of the things you need to keep in mind on fertility, uh, managing those seed beds, whether it's no-till or if you're actually tilling out there before you sow that wheat, and then planting rate, depth, and date. So With that in mind, we thank you for your time and we thank you for your business. Nick, it's always important for folks to know where to find us if they can't find us in the field. They can find us at podcast.pioneer.com. They can find me on Twitter, at Nick Money. And I'm at the Jamie Farmer. At Dickie Scott. And with that, again, if you're looking for more timely agronomic info, always reach out to your Pioneer sales professional to get signed up for those Walking Your Fields newsletters and other timely agronomic updates delivered to your inbox. Thank you for your time, and we thank you for your business. look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you.